Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's Fateless podcast episode. It's going to be a fun one. We're going to be talking about some of the differences between complexity and simplicity in game design and some of our thoughts on how to strike that proper balance. Going to be joined by Dirk and Paul here, as long with uh, Veiled Shot. So, Veiled, uh, go ahead and let everybody know who you are, what you do, and all that good stuff. What's going on, everybody? It's uh, it's pretty awesome to be here. I've been kind of uh, tuned to Fateless a little while for... Just preparing to make a brand new channel for the the game coming out because I'm pretty hyped uh, to cover the game because that's what I do on a regular basis. I just make a bunch of videos on a bunch of different games that I've been playing recently. And, uh, well, I guess I'm excited to talk about some games, huh? Heck yeah, love it, love it. It's always good to get perspectives from content creators out there uh, in the scene as well. So, yeah, I guess just in general, um, we'll start with you, Paul. Um, is there a game out there that you think is a good example that got things right in terms of getting a, a good blend of being simple enough for casuals to onboard properly while also being complex enough to keep some of the end game uber try hard 12 hour a day grinders engaged? Is there something that pops off the top of your head there? Um, you know, I think I think raid ironically. I know it's kind of like a weird default to go to does it quite well in the sense that you can play the game without actually needing to know what you're doing to some extent like it's pretty easy to figure out that i need five champions and those five champions go into a team but it's got the like the really deep level speed tuning and advanced like configurations and how you use different champions together so it's not just a case of like i've played some games where I, and i ca categorize them as the game plays you um, a recent one that our, our, our friend hit bill shop will know is heroes of middle earth which unfortunately or fortunately, I don't really know where I'm at with it, has got cancelled. But that's an example of a game where it's literally like, hey, you just got a shield, put the shield on. I'm like, okay. And then it's like, hey, you got a weapon, you need to upgrade that weapon. I'm like, okay, do I get a choice? No, no, just press the button. And all you end up doing is you're playing a clicking simulator. And that's an example where I would say like those types of games where it's almost like there's no gearing decisions, there's no, you just basically put on what you're given and then you, it's a case of the grind is the game. Those are like too simple. But I actually think Raid does a very good job of of kind of keeping it simple enough that, you know, it's easy to understand what you need to do. Like, hey, this champion does AOE damage. This champion does, I don't know, single target damage. This champion does enemy max HP damage. Granted, some of the descriptions are terrible, but I think that's an endemic problem with every single video game that we play. Um, what it says doesn't actually mean what it does. But when you actually start then getting into the, the, the nuts and bolts of the game, it's one of the most... Um, one of the most complex, not so much complex, but the deepest game that I've played in a very long time. Um, you know, if you exclude like MMOs and more crazy things like ARPGs. Um, okay. So yeah, cool. so that would be, I know it's a bit of a cheapskate to say the main game here, which, which I play a lot of, but it, it is kind of like, that's probably why I played yeah, it Like, could so be why it's your main game. Like, you know, yeah. uh, and I think Raid did do a good job with the gearing. Uh, a lot of times when I play other mobile titles that compete with Raid, I just hit like auto equip and I'm like, oh, whatever they throw on there is fine. I don't, I don't even know what's going on my first few days. Raid did a good job of making you make those decisions and they don't even give you the auto equip option, which I guess would be a good topic for, for discussion someday. Like, is that a good thing? Like, should you give auto equip or should you force the player to be like, oh, I should put life seal on because I want my Kale to heal himself. So yeah, it, Raid does a good job. Um, Dirk, is there any game that stands out to you different than Raid that maybe got that blend right? I guess just real quick, I do want to say, like, uh, I actually agree with, with Paul on that. Like, and this is ironically great, but it, it it is very simple. Obviously, it's meant to be accessible to get as many people in there as possible. But it's a reason they went so hard on their advertising campaign where every single YouTuber on any topic is brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends. Um, is they, they know the game's accessible and meant to bring in a wide variety of people. But there's a lot of depth to it. Like, um a lot of ways you can min-max your teams once you do figure out the mechanics of the game. Uh, a lot of ways you can build the same champion to do completely different things to where it's fun to have, you know, multiple copies of the same person. So, yeah, I'm doing this build and this one, this build and this one. Um, so I think they did a pretty good job with that. But I'm like, I think Watcher is very simple, um, maybe too simple, where it's, it gets a little bit boring later on. Like, I don't ever think about, like, oh, what build do I want to try next in this guy? Um, now, a game that I do think that now is... Uh, obviously fresh on the mind last epoch. Um, and I think they did a very good job kind of striking the balance between like complexity and accessibility. Whereas if you look at like uh, this, if you, I don't know, in the spectrum, you'd have Diablo here is like the super accessible one. They deliberately try to make everything as simple as possible. So you just go into it, you don't have to think a lot, you know, 
Yeah, yeah, there is like you build options later on, but early on you're just kind of like, okay, this skill does this. I can put, you know, I can modify it slightly to do this one extra thing. But and they not, literally, literally just give you a green arrow. Like if yeah. this is an upgrade, you put this on. <laughs> yeah. Not like big trees and a lot of like decisions to make anything and like uh, how it all comes together later on. There's you know some tweaking you can do, but it's not like you're in the main focus of the game. Whereas like Path of Exile, um, and this is I'm sure overwhelming to many people and very encouraging others is when you gain your first level and you're like, okay, well, let's just take a look at what I can spend this point on. And you open it up and you get this like constellation of like the universe. And you're like, whoa, this is, where do I put my skill point? And I know I don't, I've, I've tried to get so many friends to play the game with me. You're like, oh, come on, this game's so sweet, you gotta try it. And they're literally done at that moment. They open it up and they're like, huh, I gotta, and then it's like, oh yeah, make sure you plan your build. And it's like, well, I just started playing this game seven seconds ago and I'm supposed to like know where I'm putting my points. And it's like, cause if you don't, you're like, well, have fun respecting. So. I literally yeah. quit the game. I did yeah, exactly that. I, I, I started I, playing. I thought I'll play a season. I'll, you know, what they call it? Like it, the expeditions or seasons, right? They call it. Um, uh, so I started playing it, got to my first skill tree, looked at the skill tree. I was like, <laughs> I don't know what any of this does. Closed game didn't go back. And I was just like, you know, and I think like, as you said, Diablo kind of did the same thing with Paragon boards, but they didn't do it at like level one. You actually had to get to like level 50. And then you started doing like the complex kind of like, well, what kind of nodes do you want? What kind of glyphs do you want? And all that kind of stuff. And even that wasn't anywhere near the level of depth that the POE has. But once you get into POE, it's probably very exciting. But yeah, that that first view is, is, a, le is, is a lesson. And I suppose POE have just kind of like gone into it now and accepted it's it, that's the direction they want to go. But like from a game development point of view, especially mobile gaming, like you cannot do, that's like a death sentence for your game where you basically, the first thing that a player experiences is like a wall of text and they have no idea what any of it means because they're just going to quit and stop playing. So yeah, yeah I think um, Fox, go ahead. Perfectly in the center on that one where they, they wanted, I guess the end game, like build diversity and strategic thinking that Path of Exile offers and how you want to build the guy, customize it to do exactly what you want, give your own like personal flair, um, while still making it not overwhelming to the player as they're just getting into it. And um, I'm guessing that Path of Exile 2, they're going to try to do something similar because originally it seemed like they're trying to make Poe 2 be like a, uh, it was like an expansion almost. It was the initial push and then it's been delayed like three years and now it's turning into its own standalone game, which I'm glad and i think they're going to try to go that route to try to catch people like you so it, i i'm sure it's turned away more people than it's like sucked into it in that well, i'm glad they decided to go with making it a standalone game i hate it when games do what overwatch did and it's like we're gonna release overwatch 2 oh but it's overwatch 1 it's just kind of like a dlc it's like well wait so why is it overwatch 2 like it should just be yeah <laughs> yeah I, so i i would like I can, I can just tell you my own anecdotal evidence. I'm way more likely to play POE 2 than I would have been to play a POE expansion. So I'm I'm glad that they that they went that route. But Veiled, um, is there is there an example that jumps off you uh, before we kind of switch gears here? Is there is there one that hit that blend? Uh, for for me, it's my my all time most played game. Uh, that's League of Legends. It's 100 percent in my opinion. The balance again when when you're talking about ARPGs, you're talking about Last Seed Park, you're talking about Diablo Three, Diablo Four, and then you're talking about PoE. It is in that sphere where you talk about MOBAs. You have like Dota, you have you know Heroes of the Storm, you have Smite, you have League of Legends. Well, League of Legends is right in the middle where Dota is considered the all-time most difficult. You know, MOBA, you got to do all these things to understand what's going on in the game. And Smite and Heroes of the Storm are kind of just the casual, like, load up a game, do whatever the heck you want, and you're going to have some fun. You're going to do well. But um, as someone who's, like, played <laughs> an absurd amount of hours in this game, we're talking, like, 30,000 plus hours in League of Legends over the course of my life, I, I, I could definitely tell you that there is there's a level to where some people just don't understand kind of the, the the higher levels of the game. Maybe don't dive in as deep or just kind of just playing for casual purposes. And oftentimes I will play that way as well, where I'm just loading up a game. I just want to have some fun and, you know, 
easily pick out a build, gives you recommended items, it gives you recommended build paths, and all of that's fine. And then there's some situations where maybe you're trying to grind, maybe you're trying to reach the next level, and okay, the recommended build path, yeah, that's just generally good, but maybe you're fighting a specific character on the enemy team, you got a specific teammate, you got specific team comps, maybe you got some sort of uh, power spike, maybe you get an early gold injection, whatever it is, there's all sorts of different you know variations. And if you don't understand League of Legends, you might understand a 1% of what I'm talking about here, but essentially, there's just different pathways that you can go based on all the different compositions around you that really determine a, a more valuable kind of direction versus what the game kind of just offers you right off the bat. And I think that's where I find the balance to be perfect, where, hey, if I load a game and I don't know how to do anything, I don't know what my character does, I don't know how to build them. And if I just follow what the game recommends me, I'm going to do reasonably well and I'm going to have fun. That's where I want to be. But also at the same time, I want to be able to actually try to change things up if I know more about the game. And that's that's League of Legends for me, for sure. Yeah, it's a good yeah. shout out on the recommended. I, I would like that in a game like Raid, if like, because a lot of these games, like I said, they just let you uh, hit a button, like auto gear. I would like it if a game popped up a little tooltip, like, hey, maybe Kale would make sense in Lifesteal so that he can heal himself as you're progressing. A, a little tooltip like that for new players would be great. Like maybe try Lifesteal plus Speed, Lifesteal plus Cruel. Um, and instead of just letting them click a button, it's more like you're giving them the fishing rod instead of the fish. You know, like like you're you're showing them how to do it and how to uh, set themselves up for success long term. But Paul, it looks like you wanted to jump in with something yeah, so new I was talking about. Um, I actually remember when they upgraded that shop in League of Legends because uh, the old system was a bit bit naff and a bit whatever. And they, yeah. then they did this new recommended path line and it's actually really good because what they did and what they realized is they've, they they added more and more legends and more and more heroes to the game, or whatever you want to call them, champions, characters. And what you tend to find with any game development is you start off small, it's pretty straightforward, and then you add this and then you add this and then you and then it's like five years into development, all of a sudden you've got a very complicated game that you haven't you need to almost like refactor your introduction phase too, because what was like new player information back when you launched is not the same now. You've added all these different features and additions and complexities. What they actually did, which is really smart with that system, is they made it dynamic so that you pick your first item and then they will dynamically change the next recommended item based on what you pick. Because they have this concept in League of Legends where it was like mythical items. I think they're still called mythic items. I haven't played in about six months because... Uh, I kind of I've been off it for a while, but you picked like it was almost like the the, the direction your build was going to go if you pick like an attack speed one, and then it would start recommending the actual like, weapons and gear that it would recommend that works well with that. So it wasn't just like a, a default template; it was actually had some dynamic logic to it, and that was really smart. And it it mean, means, as you say, like if you just want to play the game and just want to have a bit of fun, and you don't really know what you're doing, there are heroes that they developed like Yumi, which was specifically designed for the casual to basically sit on the character and do nothing and make everyone else hate the game um so much so that they had to actually <laughs> rework that character in the end because the pro players were just like this character is so easy it's way too powerful because they just made it way too powerful um so they you know you have those easy straightforward 80 carries like caitlin just sit there and trap and shoot and trap but there is depth to those characters as well it's like when do you jump off with you me when do you jump on when do you put a trap down do you put a trap down and combine it with different things at night like, there's lots of depth to the character even though it's straightforward so yeah, I think League of Legends is a great example of where they've managed to strike a very good balance, especially considering it is meant to be a jump in and have fun game. What you don't want to have, and I think this is where ARPGs will suffer continuously and will always suffer with it in terms of a player base. They'll, they'll always have a core following, but they will never reach the heights of something like a League of Legends in terms of player numbers because it takes, you, you to some extent, like POE, you need an academic degree to play the game, right? You, you need to have read like, <laughs> 10 articles or 10 guides or something to understand the core concepts, then you can start playing the game. Whereas League of Legends, it's just like, oh, right, so I got a, I got this archer that shoots people. Great, let's go. 30 minutes, in I go. They're always going to have more accessibility. So that might be fine for a game like PoE because what, you, what, you will, what you'll find with a game like League of Legends, I guess, and this is kind of like the simplicity versus complexity, if it's simple, you're not necessarily going to create a loyal fan base. You might create some loyal fan base, but you will have a lot of people that just go, oh, that was a bit of fun. You know, games like Fortnite will go up and down a lot because they have some core people there, but a lot of people will just jump in because they're bored for 20 minutes and, you know, do a few rounds. You're not going to have that like loyal fan base, whereas ARPGs, because of the depth and the way that they develop it, you know, you say something bad against PoE, you might get killed by some people. Like they have <laughs> a loyal fan base 
Um, because it's obviously very complex. So therefore, you've got these people constantly talking and named people in the community that are like that guy knows what he's talking about and he's like an encyclopedia of knowledge. So um, but yeah, it's really, really cool. Is one it... thing on the um the champion guide, Brad. Sorry, I don't want to dominate. No, go ahead, it, but... you're fine. One of the best things that Dragon Age just released uh, literally two days ago, and they almost did it like on under the um, under the radar, is they did exactly what you suggested that should happen. They they completely reworked their hero guide, and it literally kind of like gives a, a one sentence that explains what it does, some little tags that kind of says the debuffs it does, recommended like um, what kind of stats you should put into it. It even goes and recommends where you play them and what artifacts and basically what sets. It doesn't give you like here's a blank document of exactly how you build them, which is what you get with some uh, like ARPG guys. So if you go on to something like Max Roll or or uh, Wowhead and that, they'll literally give you build this item with this, that, this way, this, that. So it's, the guide is playing the game for you. They, but these kind of like little ways of kind of going, did you think about using this artifact set? Is really helpful for a player to learn the game. And once they start learning the game, they get addicted to the game. And that's how you encourage people to keep playing your game. Yeah. I, I was going to ask you, is it, is it fair to compare like League of Legends and and uh, PoE though? Because in League you're building for a thirty minute match and then you're starting from scratch. In PoE you're going off on a journey of a hundred hours of building something. So it it, it kind of has to be more complex. You, you like because you don't play PoE for thirty minutes on one character and then start over. So, so I think League is just going to inherently cater to being more accessible because you're not setting off on a hundred hour journey right out the gate yeah i guess but it's also depending where you put that that conversation do you put it on the developer like does, is it good for for the the studio to have complexity or is it good for the player so like you said for the player to keep playing path of exile they're going to need complexity because if you want them to play for 100 hours it can't just be simple but a player playing League of Legends, in order for them to continue to keep playing the game, there needs to be some reason to keep, they can't just keep playing the same game over and over again. So they, they, it's like, it's like where do you put it? Like, so from, as you said, if, if you had like the complexity of PoE and League of Legends, nobody would play the game because it takes too long to play the game. But at the same time, if you put the complexity of League of Legends, I suppose in PoE, how long, how much playability would there be? So it, it really depends, I guess, on the developer versus the player level. Does the developer want more complexity or does the player want more complexity to make it work? Yeah. Yeah. And I think ahead, uh <clears throat> I think it's interesting because you're you're right. It's kind of hard to compare like an ARPG to a MOBA. They're they're very different games. It's almost like trying to compare like StarCraft to League of Legends. It's like they're team game. Or the one's a team game, one's a single player game. We're gonna have this totally argument different. again veiled on which one takes more skill. <laughs> you, should we do that now live here? You want <laughs> all right, it's okay, it's okay. So, yeah, he he's a pro uh, he was previously a pro player, he's better than me. You know, we got it. <laughs> uh, but it, it's certainly, um, you know, when you when you start comparing, like, for example, ARPG to ARPG, you, you can look at Path of Exile and, we, and as, you know, staff over here, I already said, we, we look at the skill tree and we're like, all right, well, you know, maybe maybe like next 10 years from now or whatever, I'll try it again, you know, <laughs> like, and I did the same thing. I, I, I launched the game. I was trying a build. And then John, Trigger Happy John comes over and he's like, yo, what are you doing? Like. Did you not follow a bill? Like, did you not plan? I was like, no, I just trying out some skills. And he, he like sent me like a screenshot of his build at like level 10. I followed it and boom, suddenly I'm like the most overpowered character in the entire game. It was just because I didn't know anything how to work the skill tree. When you look at a game like Last Epoch, for example, imagine if you pulled up Path of Exile skill tree and you were to zoom in as close as you possibly could. And then you screenshotted that. And that is what your skill tree looks like in Last Epoch for each individual subset of classes. They kind of give it to you in bites, right? You start off the game, you have like your initial class and you have that little tiny screen of things to choose from. And you learn that it's still a lot of information, but it's still like a tiny portion of what Path of Exile gives you. You get up to level 15, you get your mastery class and boom, suddenly you have a couple of additional skill trees that you can get your hands on and start experiencing. So I think that is certainly like, yeah, you're still building for the level 100. You're still building as you go along, but it's kind of feeding you small bites as you go along and somewhat of the recommended items, uh, essentially, as you go through and progress throughout the game. And that to me is like much more of a similar comparison that kind of lets you grasp what the game is trying to give you. Because again, if you pull up Path of Exile, you're sitting there and respecting is not an easy thing. It's not like, oh, I can just go through the game and figure it out as I go. If you do that, you're going to be way behind, not because your build's just 
week, but also because it costs resources to go back and redo it. So not only is it difficult to learn, difficult to approach, but it's also punishing to mess up. And all that combination is kind of rough for newer players. Whereas when you're talking about Last Epoch, it's not really nearly at all that point. And it's certainly for League of Legends, when you talk about building for like one game, yeah, it can give you some recommended items and you're building for that one game. But then let's say you follow those recommended items. Okay, turns out that recommended items maybe just not that great in that specific situation. You take that into the next game and suddenly, yeah, you may not be like building for a level 100 character, but you're building your knowledge on each one of these characters and how to build them in each every single one of these games. And that's kind of where the, I guess you'd say building for the long term comes in where it's, yeah, these aren't actually the best items in every single situation. And you have to learn that just like you do in your building for level 100 for whatever ARPG it is. Yep, yep. I like the the comment on the bite size uh, way to do it. So maybe in like a game that we're designing, yeah, it, it may, that's why it may, you see these mobile games like Raid do that, where it's like at level eight on your account, you'll unlock the arena. At level 12, you'll unlock, you know, this dungeon. And then, oh, look, here's Masteries and here's the Minotaur. They, they, they slowly kind of bring these systems into you instead of, okay, boom, you just started your account. You picked Kale. Now do Masteries. Now do the books. Now go into the arena. They they kind of join a clan and, and tag team and Hydra. They, they slowly, in bite size, give that to you. I would say they don't, though. I, I think mobile games... And I know why they do it, but I, I think mobile games are notoriously bad with death by a thousand game modes. That's the way I look at it. You literally play the game and it's like, oh, you've just unlocked a new game mode. It's like, I've barely figured out this game mode. And now it's another game mode and another game mode. And then what ends up happening, and this is why they do it, players go, I don't know what to focus on. Oh, there's a pack. Maybe I need to buy that pack, right? I mean, this, that's basically why they do it. It's like, oh, you've just unlocked the forge, the, the forge, go buy the forge parts. That's how you, that's what you need to do. You've unlocked Hydra. You need to go buy some, sh you need more champions. You need six, right? And it's kind of like, I, I feel like, if you think about when we play the free to play series, you get to level 40 within a few days. And by that point, you you start unlocking things like Hydra in a few levels. You start unlocking Cintranas by level 15. So that, that stuff is eight months down the line in terms of what you, you could consider doing. And they do it because they obviously want to make you feel overwhelmed, not because they think you'll quit, but because they think you will use your money to become less overwhelmed uh, in mobile games. And I, I actually think that's kind of a, a an endemic problem a little bit with the way that mobile games are developed where they they just it's almost it's just death by a thousand game modes i i played bloodlines which was okay but then they kept giving me loads and loads i was like finding game modes in event menus and i was like what oh this is like a doom tower thing okay well i guess i'll climb the doom tower thing i didn't know this thing was i don't even know what it's for but it said put five champions and off i went until i didn't do it and it's just kind of like death more more keep throwing game modes and i think raid does it pretty badly i think you get far too many things in raid before you're ready for it and then we almost as content creators have to go in and say why are you why are you doing hydra oh well the game unlocked it but why you can't even do dragon just just stop and go back to what you should be doing so yeah i mean staggered approach is like like i think that's what diablo did very well as in terms of their game content they focus on the storyline before you get into the real game which is the seasonal end game content um, granted, they didn't have much when they went live, but still. Um, and I think, you know, I haven't played Last Epoch yet, but it sounds like that's what Last Epoch are doing very well. But Path of Exile is, it's almost like you're, they, I think they know what they are and they, they almost like, in, like, they almost go for it. They almost invest into it. They want people who are addicted in that way. So they don't really worry about the, the simplicity angle. What if Raid gated it behind a certain, um, achievement threshold, like, um, valheim did this like you can't you can't mine resources in the black forest until you kill the first boss like you just can't do it what if so what if raid was like to access the hydra you got to beat dragon 25 like like so yeah, like what, what if like they gated it behind achievements and then once you prove you're a certain power hey you know you've progressed this far in the game maybe try out the hydra you might be strong enough to uh to enter yeah it's better but I also think you, what you don't want to do is create the game so that it hand held, you know, hand holds you all the way. If you don't want to follow necessarily that path and you want to go a different path, then the game needs to have, you know, the open platform to do that. Because the worst thing in the game is when it's like, I don't want to do it. Like, how many of us have played tutorials? 
and was just like, look, I know what I'm doing. Let me, let me just get, I don't want to do the tutorial. Stop telling me to press this button. Just let me do it. <laughs> I just want to skip. Go away. That's me every and, time. And we, we did yeah. a poll on our uh, on our YouTube channel asking if people uh, play the tutorial or not. I think it was like 90, 10. Uh, you guys go ahead. I'm going to try to look up that poll. Yeah, I think it's interesting because um, I, I I know, I don't know if everyone here, but I, I know at least two of you have played a Dragonair. And I think, honestly, Dragonair kind of steers on the opposite side of things as a lot of mobile games where it's like for the first 12 to 13 hours of gameplay realistically it's kind of just guiding you through the storyline and and that could be fun for some people um and i know for a fact chosen is definitely not one of them and i myself am also not one of them i was sitting there through the first like three or four hours and i'm like just get me to the first gear dungeon like just get me to the first gear dungeon i don't want to be time locked by like certain days. I don't want to be sitting here waiting for my quest to reset so I can level up a certain amount. I don't want to be sitting here waiting uh, so that I could finish this storyline. I just want to like get in. I want to use my characters and I don't want to be doing these like random, you know, quests where I run around the map and find like some sort of egg in a bush and then like return. Like that's just not, you know, my kind of gameplay that I enjoy. Uh, and so the fact that they kind of limit you at least for when you're first starting out the game in what you can access can be a little off-putting but of course in that situation it's only for the beginning of the game so you know as long as you get through that then you start experiencing the full game at a regular basis but i, I do think that that's something that well a lot of games have to be careful about because you got people like chosen and i that are just gonna be like all right you know what <laughs> we'll just move on like i'm done here yeah I'm that's my <laughs> that's my philosophy is like i i don't want to hear the story while i'm trying to play what i do I blast Diablo 4 as fast as possible. And then when I'm eating dinner or something, I'll pull up a video and I'll watch the Diablo lore. It's like, now just tell me the story when I'm not playing. And that's what I like to do. But it's funny because we're like in the minority, I think, because I have to fact check myself here. I went and looked up our poll and I asked, do you actually care about playing a game's tutorial or skip it as fast as you can? And 60% of people in the audience said they want to play it. So like, it's actually the minority to be like, oh, I just want to skip it as fast as possible. So I think like us being the majority like content creators or people that have been competitive gamers for 25 years or something, we can have a different perspective than like the normal player that downloads a game and they want to play a hero collector and have some fun. It's difficult. Yeah, it is difficult because it's kind of like if you give the optional button, you just know that people are even if they don't know what they're doing, they're going to say skip. Why? Right, it says I can skip. I'm just going to skip. And then literally an hour later, they'll come back and they'll go, I don't know what this means. Like, what well, did you do the tutorial? Oh no, I skipped that. And it's like, <laughs> well, that's why you don't know what to do, right? Uh, Dragonair, yeah, I do think some of the storyline was almost like structured and a bit restricted. And their time pacing is very difficult. Like the first six weeks of a season, you're kind of like sitting around, you're doing a few areas, you're logging maybe for an hour, you do a few things. And then the last six weeks, almost like, now you need to do 13 world bosses every single day, all the time. If you don't, you're gonna lose your leaderboard. And you're like, stress, so much stress levels. But what they do, there is some things in there that are quite well. I like the way they do their fey meander, uh, where it's like they don't give you all 120 floors on day one, so you've done it in one day, but it's not a key system either. So you're not missing out if you say, do you know what, today I don't really fancy doing fey, I'm going to go farm some dungeons, or maybe I just don't have time to do that today, and then tomorrow I can come along and I've got six floors to do. So it just, you get access to more floors day, bit, bit by bit, but you're not actually, you know, you're not actually losing anything, but you're not forced to do it either. That's like that's like the perfect balance, I think, in any sort of content where, um, you know, time gating is an issue in terms of trying to make it simple or complex or something. Giving people the ability to choose when they want to do something, but still controlling that they can't just do it instantly. Because what you don't want is someone to go and blast the game and finish. Because then you're like, well, what else are they going to do? So you've got to stagger it somewhere. That, that I thought was a very good way of doing it. And like Raid, which is like, if you miss too many days of Centranos, you can't do it you, physically you can't do it so then you feel defeated and you quit that reason you know because it's like well you know i've I missed four days of the month and now i can't do anything that's a bit yeah, even raid um they put up guardrails against that um because like in raid even if you're a, a billionaire the, you can't buy as many void shards as you want like they, they 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 you have to wait for a pack to pop up or you get like those little offers in the shop where you can get like five of them and do it five times a month you have to actually if you want to collect all of the best champions of the game, you actually have to play for a while. Uh, yeah, a little bit. They're getting less like that. But yeah, I think the the primal shards, for example, you can buy as many as you want. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, but not Let voids, right? That. Not the uh, Plarium covets their void shards the most. 
I don't think you can, you can't just like infinitely buy voids, right? Uh, no, I, I think, um, well, it depends. You do get that like 24 for 59 pack if you're, if you're a Kraken. You get that every single day or oh, every other day, I think it is. Yeah, but you can't um, just like spend a billion dollars on void shards, right? You can't like. Um, you... No, but you can on primal shards. Yeah, yeah. So the primal shard eight pack has no limit. So if you just want to buy like 700 primal shards, you can just go buy, 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 keep buying, keep buying, keep buying, keep buying, keep buying, keep buying and keep going. Whereas the voids they've capped out now. So, which I mean, to be honest, is a bit strange because if you think about it, you don't actually need as many primal shards to get your, your mythical champions because there's like nine of them. So, in in context, like how many how, how many you need versus how much the void shards, you're going to need a lot more. And especially when you think primal shards give you boosted legendary rates as well, so you probably end up getting a lot of legendaries on that path. So, yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because <clears throat> oh, go ahead, Bill. I was going to say, Diablo Immortal did something similar uh, as soon as kind of I, we stopped playing. But afterwards, they uh, I, I, I like the the Famiander because that was one system that I actually did enjoy in that game. I don't know if anyone's played Honkai Star Rail as well, but that game also had a very similar kind of aspect of time gating where, you know, you could only get so far, even if you were spending money inside the game um, at a certain pace. But that can sometimes backfire for a lot of people that actually do want to play more and the way i like to see it is something like the fame meander or uh, in diablo immortal where every day you get a certain bonus you get to do a certain amount of content and if you miss a day you can go back and you can do all of it without being punished at all and immortal had a system where every single day you could farm a certain amount of set items at boosted drop rate so you can get a bunch of set items you log in for an hour or so you farm some dungeons you get your boosted set items okay that's done. But if you don't play for, let's say, a couple days, it starts to stack up. You get multiple days of kind of insurance. You can just go in and do way more dungeons one day. Or maybe you do, I don't know, two days worth, but you still have that one day left over. And that's type that those types of systems, I think, are very, uh, very refreshing as a player because there are a lot of times where you're like, oh, crap. Uh, and I know I feel this way a lot. It's like, I forgot to do my advanced quests or something like that. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh man, like I am now one short or like two short or whatever of my legendary book at the end of all the quests. It's like, that feels really bad. And I think that's the core thing, which is you just want to avoid that, that experience, that quit moment feeling where it's like, that sucks. Like that feels bad. And as much as you could do to avoid that, that's kind of the, the sweet spot. And, and certainly systems like that where you're like, oh, sweet i could just log in and do them all like i didn't miss anything that's great like i'm totally down for that yeah it's a it's a double-edged sword because they do want to create that urgency for you to feel like you're rewarded for being active um but yeah you, you don't want to go a toxic level um so i think a, a good blend is like immortal uh giving you like back credit like like okay you can miss a day and still make up for it you don't absolutely lose out on everything i actually my favorite thing about immortal was the fractured plane i i absolutely loved that and i and i hope we could someday kind of pull off a a way to bring that concept into this genre and if you guys didn't play the fractured plane <clears throat> was no money it, it was normalized and you would get like a new character and it was all skill. It was like you go through, you clear levels, and then you get presented like gear options as you clear and you get like a budget to spend. And so like how you build your champion and how you play, you would then get rewards at the end if you finish it. And there was like a leaderboard and everything and there was no whaling. It was everybody on the equal playing field. And it was uh, it was really awesome. I really enjoyed clearing the fractured planes. So it'd be fun to bring that to something like Ray, but it's kind of tough to pull off. Yeah, I think with them, like the Doom Tower thing, what all they really, it's very simple some of the things that what they should do is just like let the keys just stack up you know if you think like a doom tower what you can do is that have it so that once the doom tower resets the key resets if you didn't do any of them then you start at zero but because you're in this situation where it's like well if you don't log in and do your doom tower you can miss like maybe four days it becomes very exhausting because if i just want to take a day off raid you really can't you miss clan boss you miss this you miss that and it becomes almost like you know that's where you start creating it's a balance you don't want to make it a full-time job but you the for a developer's perspective this is why i said it's a developer's position position and a player's position the developer wants you logging in the developer wants you on the game because if you're on the game you're improving their daily active users their average play time stats these are great from an investor's point of view but you're also looking at more packs the longer you're on the screen, the longer you're seeing the packs, the longer you're paying. Like, that's kind of like what they want you to do. So it's kind of like, well, we don't want to give you like, you know, 
a holiday. What, what's this concept of a holiday? You're not allowed a holiday. You've got to stay on the shop. You've got to buy stuff, right? You've got new holidays packs to see today. Home. Yeah, that's that's what a holiday is. It's... <laughs> yeah, I mean, they don't do this. No vacation in Rage Shadow Legends. And that's that's what they want. Now, you know, that's I think there's a level of requirement for that in a game. You don't necessarily want people to go into the game, do the Doom Tower in one day, for example. That was in, wasn't that in Awakened Chaos Era Veiled, I think? You, you, you played. I remember you, you played. It. Um, yeah, you could just every month. That's what I would do. I would sit on stream boom. for like 12 hours and then just do the whole thing. And that, that was a little bit on the odd side of things for sure. I did not remember that ever being in a game. I do think Raid takes it too far, though. I mean, when I stopped playing Raid, I felt like I lost like 20 pounds or like just like I could just breathe easier, like I quit smoking or something like Oh wow! Like the yeah. sky was just brighter, and like the birds were just more cheerful. Like it's, it's just, like in the Wizard of Oz when the house falls on the witch, like the yeah, flowers yeah, start I blooming. The, the, my world again. I'm like, it's like the, the children come out to play. I uh, get my chores done. Oh my god! Oh, it's Sunday. Oh, it's resets coming up. I gotta get my hydrate and all. I hope the orgies. I'm like this just became so much. And like you said, you can't miss a day. You miss one day, like there's no making it up. There's no like. You just think about, oh, God, how many resources did I miss? I could, I could have been a sacred shard. Oh, Jesus. Why did I miss clan boss? Like, yeah, I don't know. That, obviously, you have to reward, like, the consistent login, but just giving, like, a, a day or two grace. Like, in Hearthstone, you get your daily each day, and, like, you could stack it up to three. So you can, in theory, play every three days, once every three days and just knock them all out and be good. And, yeah, I think it's a lot less stressful that way. So I think that's another – I mean, we didn't – Maybe that's off of uh, the complexity versus accessibility, but it, it kind of touches on it. Just that, like, how much do you want to? I guess how much time do you want to demand of your players? Is like I know it, that stress does build up, and you don't realize it until maybe you stop playing it, and all of a sudden you're like, "Oh, this is what it felt like before I started playing this game." Hold I, I love that. Uh, I love this co that conversation topic because <laughs> you're right. It's kind of off the whole simplicity versus complexity standpoint, but I honestly. I actually feel like it it does tie in in that like the idea of trying to finish everything without missing anything is actually very complex from like, how do I get it all done at perfect times? And to be honest, I'm not someone that actually enjoys not playing the games. This is why I play multiple games all at the same time, because I like that feeling of like, oh, I have a reset of 11 a.m. or 11 p.m. I have a reset at 12 p.m. I reset at 2 a.m. I need to make sure that like I'm playing Four different blue stacks on my screen. Oh, when I'm running this dungeon, that means that game's running. I can do this at this time. And that's what my mind's hat like racing all the time. It's like the complexity in that for me is like, oh, I'm playing multiple games at a time. I need to figure out how to get all these done on my account with the least amount of time spent. And, and that to me is like part of it. I actually think that a lot of mobile game players, while they, a lot of people say like, hey, I don't want to spend a ton of time in raid. And that is certainly true. There's also like the opposite is true. Like I remember playing Awakened Chaos Era or easier gotcha games. And well, my feeling and a lot of other people's feeling was there's not enough things to do. There's not enough time to spend. There's not enough, you know, stress in my life about this game. Like I need a little bit more complexity in regards to either things to do or complicated things to do inside the game. So I do think that that kind of factors in if you have complex game modes and a lot to do, that also adds to the complexity of a game. And I think that also is part of the balance is we, we need to make sure that there is a lot of stuff to do so that you can invest your whole day in it. Or, you know, maybe every other day if you're if it you're not like good. some of the more addicted players. <laughs> when you learn to balance your time like that, like I mean, that is that's why free to play runs are so fun and popular. It's because once you play the game and you're like, you know, like, OK, this is I do these chores at this time and get this done, like it's fun to start that fresh run and just blast through it like a, you know, like a pro. Cause you, you, you've got your time balance so well. You're like, okay, oh, I know everything I'm doing now. So there is like that skill to the game of like the time management and ma making things a lot easier. So I guess it's maybe it's, some of them would come down to like teaching players how to manage their time could almost be part of the game's responsibility too. Um, there has to be a degree of respect in the time, but yeah, but still making For it sure. Hard to, that when you as a player have developed that skill of being able to juggle it all efficiently to where you're like, ah, I even have time to go outside today. Like, it, you know, as long as I have my phone in my pocket, I'm making sure I update my hand. <laughs> yeah, as long as you have like, oh, I can press the, the replay button in my pocket. So that's the only requirement. <laughs> I, I think there's a, there is a difference between complexity and depth as well. That's a very big difference in the sense that 
a game can be simple, but have a lot of depth to it. But a game can be complex and have not a lot of depth to it. And I, I think that's a very interesting segue because things like the Curse of Sintranus that they added to Raid Shadow Legends, a lot of people would say that's very complex, very difficult because there's loads of different restrictions and everything, but there's not a lot of depth to it because what ends up happening is they restrict you to such an extent that you end up going, I'm either putting all my champions in bolster and hoping for the best, or I'm putting all my champions in stun set and I'm hoping for the best. Like there's no strategic depth to it beyond making sure that you've got the a good balance of what the champions do. Whereas when you take something like clan boss, clan boss is very simple. It's one boss that does four things and he will change affinity. That is the, the, the entirety of the complexity of the clan boss, but it's got a lot of depth to it because you can use any combination of different heroes. And when you start adding things like turn meter control effects and speed boosts at the right moment and the right speed ratios, and there's a lot of depth to making it fun, which is why the clan boss will, and in my opinion, will remain the best thing about Rage Shadow Legends that they ever did was the complex nature or the depth of clan boss, but it was a really straightforward thing. You could go, you could literally start it tomorrow, like start a game, use a clan boss key and you, you you can play it. It's easy, you understand what's going on. The clan boss ramps up over time, it's got an enrage mechanic, I gotta be, do as much damage. On a simple level, easy. But on a depth level, you know, people will come to me and go, how the hell do you understand everything that's going on? Because I'm like, well, I've learned the complexity, you know, the complexity there is about how much knowledge there is in the depth and how champions work well together and how you can get to different speed durations and a lot of math. That's that's a good balance. Um, Doom Tower also is very quite good in terms of like, that one's a bit more of a complexity challenge versus a depth challenge because it is all about control. But you do have like different bosses that provide you with different challenges so you need to learn how to you know maybe you'll go oh this boss is going to do this oh i need a freeze champion i should use this champion that i just picked up that's the fun simplistic side but it's still got a lot of depth whereas curse it's intranus is literally let's arbitrarily make it complicated and then force you down to will i weak hit and will i get a stun set which is not got any depth so it's very interesting like you can make something very deep but very simple but at the same time, you can make something very complicated, but it has no depth to it whatsoever. Um, and to some extent, ARPGs, I think, suffer from that in the sense that once the guide is written, there's not a lot of depth to the game anymore because someone's figured it out. You basically follow the guide and you play the guide and voila. But it could be very complicated. Like there could be loads of different options you can do in Path of Exile. Diablo 4, for example, suffers from it a lot where people just go, well, ball lightning was just OP. So everyone went ball lightning and you go to any content in the game, like the world boss. And it's just literally like a billion ball lightning sorcerers just swirling around the boss one shot in it because the, the guide's out. Everyone's realized this is the best in slot. The complexity has gone down the toilet and now it's a simple game. Pick this, go here, do that. And then it gets boring because people are like, oh, I have to do a thousand Dural runs. Oh, that's not very fun. You know? Well, so that's a, um, that's a challenge of, of today's, culture with the digital media and the mass streaming and the content creation like i remember trying to be a starcraft pro you know in 2007 and i remember like you know i'm eating lunch and i'm watching a replay while i'm eating lunch because i'm trying to study what the pros are doing there was nowhere i could go to get that knowledge there was no casting there was no streaming i had to research it and with a notebook and sit here and like watch what the pros were doing and then go practice it later that night now i just watch a guide from the content creator getting a million views then I loaded the game and I know what the optimal build order is for Terran. I don't have to pursue that myself. Um, yeah. So that's just a, that's just a challenge. It's going to be hard for games to kind of there's always going to be a meta. So like there's always going to be the ball lightning build that does the most damage yeah. and is the most optimal. I, I think it falls into this comp question of simplicity versus complexity, though, where it's almost like people culturally strive for the answer. Right. I remember like MMOs, the best example this is in MMOs when Le Lord of the Rings Online first came out or when World of Warcraft first came out, you didn't have like oh, go here to pick this up. It was like the quest description was like, you need to find a flower. I'm not going to tell you where it is. You're going to have to figure that one out yourself. Now, if if you release a game and it doesn't have like quest guides and like maps that tells me where, like people go, oh, this is terrible. I have to figure out what I have to do. So it is a difficulty because then if like from a developer's point of view, it's like, well, if, if I don't ship the game with this level of simplicity, then I'm going to lose my player base because they don't want to figure it out themselves. But at the same time, if I then make the game to the extent where it's, like the game tells you what to do which is those mobile games where it's like i'm not going to tell you you know you, you don't have to figure out the gearing just put this on this is the best item put this on put this on keep it just do what the game tells you 
then it's gone too far. So it's like, where do you find the balance? And that is kind of like, I guess what we're talking about is that like, this is the challenge developers have today. It's more difficult than it has ever been. Because if you make the game too simple, people quit because it's boring or they complete it too quickly. But if you make it too, too many roadblocks and too much activity going on at the same time or too many things you have to do in the day, then you also lose the player because they can't get on board and figure out what they need to do. And it's it's too complicated. So where's it's like trying to find the almost like the golden zone where it's just complicated enough that it's, it keeps the interest peaked, but not so complicated that you look at the path of XR map and delete the game pretty much straight away. That's what you don't want. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think go ahead, Bill. I was gonna say, I, th for me at least, my because I, I know that uh, not everyone uh, likes RPGs as I do or MMOs as I do, but there are a few times when I want to dive into a story, and that's going to be like the RPGs and MMORPGs, and and I always go back because it's my favorite game of all time. But Night Seal Republic is like number one game of all time for me, and I think when you're considering things like, okay, how do I strike that balance of not giving you exactly what you need to do to get through the game. But also, I don't want to sit there and have you have, well, just figure it out, just mess around with a bunch of things. It's like dropping hints or dropping, literally telling you what to do as long as you're just paying attention, but you have to go do it yourself, right? And those old school RPGs, it would be like, hey, you know, this person sells a droid. You have to go buy it from them to get into whatever military base. And those of you that played KOTOR, you'll understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, and, and it's like, okay, well, obviously I'm going to go do that. Like, that's pretty simple, but it doesn't actually just walk you over. That doesn't give you a guideline. doesn't like tell you, hey, oh, this is exactly where you need to go. You have to know, oh, I've been there before because I re remember doing a previous quest or whatever. Those types of situations are, well, kind of like peak in terms of being in the middle, but also I found that that's generally speaking, not exactly what most of the players want to do, right? Most of the casual players, most of the people that are looking for the more, not necessarily simplistic, but closer to that level, like especially when you're considering ARPGs and, and the vast majority of the player base, they actually do want a lot of the guides. They actually do want to just kind of have the game play itself to some degree, but at the same time, something like Raid, for example, does a really good job of this, where when you're talking about like the city of Cintranos, I actually had the same thoughts as you did, which was, this isn't really like that creative necessarily. It's just, I get my random five rare Sylvan Watcher characters and I'm good to go. Like, that's just what I need to do, right? And then you consider things like Dragon. And it's, you start out the game and you have a bunch of random champions that you have to figure out how to make work to get to Dragon 25. And while... Yeah, all of those situations can be different for Dragon 25. There's also a lot of ways that you can kind of streamline that process to where helping people out, giving recommended gear sets, giving those types of things can actually guide you to that path. But there's not really like a set guy that you could find online because all the different variations are so vast that you're not going to find an exact answer like you will with these other ARPGs, these other uh, guide type games where you just have the answer right there for you because of the variance. And I think that's where mobile games kind of differ from a lot of the other comparisons that we make is that the variance is so high. When you talk about ARPGs, you talk about League of Legends, like there's obviously variance, right? Like what gears drop. But at the end of the day, you can limit that variance by a lot. And mobile games... At least I feel like this is one of those situations where you can't really limit that variance to such a degree where you're in the early game and when you're going through a lot of these processes to where you can't incorporate all the different ways you can go about some sort of piece of content, especially in games where they have so many characters like Raid. And so when you're trying to figure out, okay, how do I want to get people through this game? How do I want to balance that where should I just be giving them everything that they need to know or should I just kind of let them do their thing? I think in mobile games, you have a little bit more freedom because, yeah, you actually can tell people like, here's some recommended gear sets. Here's, you know, some recommended team comps. Here's this, this and this. But at the end of the day, they still have to figure out, OK, well, what happens if I have this team that might be a little bit better, right? This composition or maybe this types of gear and this specific comp would work a little bit better. Those types of situations kind of add to that depth uh, of a game and especially for Again, mobile games, this comes into play, I think, more often than, than any other type of game that I've played, at least. It's it's really the variance. I, I think for mobile games, that's almost especially hero collector mobile games, it's almost essential 
that though that you don't have this kind of meta where one thing solves every problem because like awakened chaos era had this it had that poison i always remember this. it had like this poison yep. legendary that literally shaved about seven minutes of your dungeon times and if you had him great if you didn't have him it was playing like a different game and i think when you create that in mobile games what you end up having is this like negative FOMA it's kind of like where it's almost like well because i don't have this one thing that makes it all work there's just no point playing the game right whereas the important thing i think when you're having these mobile hero collectors is you give players how to build the champion guidance but the art is how you build them with other things and you don't tell them that right you let them figure that out themselves right i was playing raid the other day and i realized there's a really cool little thing you can do with akintum's passive where you can um activate the lethal dose from another poisoner because he repeats the poison damage that's cool that's not anywhere in a guide it's not in his skill descriptions and that's it's that the fact that i know by playing it i noticed it was doing something else and i learned and that's a fun experience whereas if the game was like oh you should definitely put this guy with another poisoner um, and put that poison with lethal dose it's like well now i'm not having any fun because you're telling me what to do um and i actually think like raid for example is suffering heavily under the meta problem at the moment where there is not enough diversity anymore and the, almost their game content development is structured around the fact that, oh, we kind of made like Newt is way too strong. He just one shots everything. Oh, Taras is just way too strong. How, how do we create compelling reasons to play the game when this champion just, I put it in any build and he just beats it. And I think their problem right now is they continuously want to, like, to make the new heroes exciting. They make them more difficult more complicated like these mythical champions and even bosses like the amount of text in amius is like you could make you could make five bosses out of the text descriptions that yeah, amius it's so has ridiculous got. it's so hard for a player to understand like even i'm doing it i'm an experienced player of raider played it for like four or five years i'm sitting there going oh i forgot he does this all right which forms it like is so much going on that it's not complex it's not like it's not interesting in the sense that I'm enjoying the, the complexity. It's almost like I'm overwhelmed with the complexity. And then it's almost like, okay, well, now I just want to beat it. I can't because I don't have one champion. That's what Sintranus is a little bit too much of me for me. It's like they've made content. They've had to put restrictions because the champions are too strong because there's a, too much of a meta. And then the restrictions stop the meta from happening. But now the restrictions have gone so extreme that it's like, oh, I have to use this like random rare HP champion that, that tickles the boss or tickles the enemy. And I'm like, great, now I have to fight the best void legendary in the game with my random rare champion. Like, what the hell? And I, I think, you know, I, th I think in terms of the simplicity versus complexity when it comes to meta and hero diversity for mobile games specifically, I think it absolutely, you know, you need to have like 30 champions that can do similar things. You want to have as many different ways and, and let, almost like, like let the players figure out the combination, but you have to give them some concepts and some idea of, you know, like oh, this, this, this hero is very good for like this type of situation, right? Or, you know, whenever, for example, player and release their new fusions or their new champions, they, they give a little text to the content creators where they're almost doing that. There's almost like the TLDR of this hero as we think is quite good here, here, and here. Now, half the time they're wrong because they have no idea what they're doing, but you know, sometimes they, sometimes they get it right. Most of the time they don't. But that's kind of like how they're approaching it. They're almost going, well, we need to give the, the people a rough idea of what this guy does. You might find this a really crazy way to use him. Awesome. Right? But we're just kind of giving you the idea of what he does. And that's roughly what we want to do. But when you put him, that's where the player needs to come in. It's like they need to figure out how they take the concept and make a team out of it. And that's important, I think, from a hero collector design point of view. Yeah, for sure. Well, we're kind of hitting the point where it's time to time to wrap up this episode. But uh, no, this was a great discussion. And uh, thanks for joining me, Dirk and Paul and Veiled Shot. If you're looking for a content creator that covers all sorts of different games, Veiled Shot's a, uh, a good option as he's off. What were you grinding during this podcast, Veiled? Be honest. I know you were doing something. What what, uh, what, what was the last Epoch? Was it Raid? What, what, what was it? Uh, I wish I could take a screenshot, like just share it. I'm like, yeah, I, got, I know, uh, I know this. <laughs> uh, we got <laughs> we have raid over here on the on the second monitor. I've got uh, I got some YouTube stuff going on my third monitor, but also I usually play with with four blue stacks open. Oftentimes, so I have Watcher of Realms up, I have Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes up, and I have Eternal Evolution and Raid up. So right now, wow. it's a total of four games, and then I have Last Epoch on the background but i'm not playing it right now because i was like well that's too intense to play while i'm trying to record a podcast you five know? games is the limit five games is a limit yeah. isn't it yeah like a fight stick played some street fighters <laughs> it's like you, you focus i'm telling you real question if, if, 
Do you act, do you actually find yourself sometimes trying to pick like, oh, I really need to pick my Taras in Eternal Evolution right now. Where is he? I can't find him in my game. And then realize you're actually in the wrong blue stacks game. Do you, do you find you're in that situation? <laughs> I, you know, I've never, I want to say I, I've done something similar, which is like, I'll be like, dude, I have this really good piece of gear. Like, where is this thing? And I'll be looking around like, I remember I had triple crit rate rolls. And I was like, where is this thing? I'm like, oh, it was in okay. raid. Like, I, I wrong Oops. game. Like, <laughs> so I've done that with gear for sure. Because uh, I don't remember exactly. I'm like, I just remember I had a good crit rate roll. You know, that's, that's as far as I go. Um, so yeah, uh, it's happened. Very nice, very nice. Well, uh, yeah, remember to join us over on the Fateless Discord where you can give your input on game design. We always keep track and take note of that, and then we cover it in a video every now and then. But yeah, thanks everybody for joining me, and we will see you soon in the next video and then the podcast episode next week. Thanks. <laughs>